Actually, no, that's wrong. I definitely, I decided I wanted to move there for about, I was planning on living in Mexico for about 10 years, you know, maybe five to 10 years. It's 
very heavy. I can't, um, I have to get very light ashtrays because of my illness, so I have um, joint pain with fibromyalgia. So I always have to buy small ashtrays, so it's easier for me to lift them, it's not too heavy. Anyway, yeah, I decided that, I, I don't know why Mexico has always appealed to me. Mexican friends in Liverpool and um, and in London. I used to live. I've lived in London, Mexico, South Africa, Greece, Wales, and Brussels. In Belgium, uh, where else? Um, Manchester in England, London, Peterborough. Anywhere, yeah. I've lived in quite a few places. and there was just something about Mexico it just pull, was always pulling me to live there and I had a lifetime ambition to work in wildlife conservation so when I was um, how old was I? it was about I think it was 7 years ago now maybe um, so I would have been late 20s yeah, late 20s um, I decided I was working in London and I was working for a really very, very, very good company. They were um, related to Google. Um, they were like a subsidiary group of Google. And um, I had a very good job. But it was a lot of, I was earning a lot of money. But um, I, it was, you had to be a workaholic to work there. Now, I am a workaholic. I love, I used to be a graphic designer web designer. Um, I was senior, I was the, um, the head of um, design for Europe and um, I loved, I loved my job. When I, when I, before I became disabled, I loved working, I loved my job. Um, I miss it, I miss working so much. Um, but this company, I mean, at least once a week somebody would break down crying. It was very, long hours, you work those crazy hours, um, and working in West London, earning a lot of money, having a high-flying job, it was great, but after a while I realised that money is not the end of the world, like money is not what makes me happy, you know, and working in the rat race in London, it, I was actually miserable, and I decided um, one day the stress of the job and the hours we were working and it, it was just too much and one day I just decided I'm going to live in, in Mexico and I'm, I'm going to live in the jungle. I just decided it <laughs> and I made it happen. It was hard but I made it happen and the way I made it happen was I've got no qualifications in wildlife conservation. Now I've always been obsessed with wildlife and conservation and studying wildlife from a young age um, and I wanted to do a university but I, I, I always, I never went to university because I always felt very like I wasn't good enough, academic enough or whatever and university doesn't appeal to me either. I've, I did do university for three months when I was very young and it, it's just not my cup of tea. I like to be hands on, you know. So. I wrote, I emailed every single um, wildlife conservation charity in Mexico and I said, look, I've got no qualifications in wildlife conservation, I have no scientific background, however, I do study wildlife conservation as a hobby, you know, I read lots of books, I um, watch lots of documentaries, I, I listen to lots of podcasts, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of my life. I would love to learn wildlife conservation at your charity and in return I will design websites for you, I will do all your graphic design for you, I will do any job that you give me. Um, I used to be, I was before I was a web designer, I was a qualified electrician for six years so I could also do electrics, engineering, you know, things like that because I used to be a, an electrical engineer before I was a web designer. So, that was
was my idea. Basically, a job that was in exchange of skills. So, the biggest charity, wildlife conservation organization, NGO in Mexico called ProNatura, they got back to me and they said, yes, they said, um, you can come here, you can work for us and once, one week, no, one week you'll be working in the office doing websites for us, doing uh, graphic design, things like that and then the other week you'll be in the jungle studying wildlife and we will teach you how to study wildlife and how to, cons and how to conserve wildlife in return you can do all our graphics and web design for us so, perfect and it was the biggest charity in Mexico so I was like this is brilliant. And luckily, one of their CEOs was from California, so he spoke English, because my Spanish is terrible. Really, really bad Spanish. My, my language is awful. Now, I tried to learn Spanish for six months. I really, really tried. I, I had lessons. Um, I, I, I read books. I did, I did you know, the, the CDs, everything, but... Hispanic, my language, for some reason, I, I'm not good at languages, anyway, so, the boss of this company, of this organisation, he was Mexican and he barely spoke English, well he did, but not very good, but luckily, one of the bosses there was American, so he spoke English, and then the, one of the people who worked there was from Paris, and he spoke very good English as well, so the French guy and the Californian guy, they were conversing with me on email and they were saying you can come here what you'll be is you'll be a volunteer you'll be a volunteer um hang on just you'll be a volunteer um so you, you will earn you, we'll pay for your board we'll pay you your rent and we'll pay you for some food but that's it and i was like okay if it's enough to live on i don't mind so that was fine it was an amazing opportunity. So, um, I went and I had to tell my boss at the Google company that I was resigning and going to live in the jungle in Mexico. <laughs> and the place that I was going to live was called Jalapa, which is um, in Veracruz, which is like, um, it's kind of, um, it's about five hours away from Mexico City. Um, it's beautiful. It's in the cloud forest. Amazing. But you're literally in the jungle. Like, there's no other, you know, it's not a big city. It's not well known. They didn't have, they'd never seen many white people, you know, things like that. So, I went into work and I went to go see my boss and I said, signing and I'm going to go live in Mexico in the jungle and do wildlife conservation and he literally was like what? and I was like yeah um, I've had enough I've had enough of the rat race I, I want to do this, I've always wanted to do this so that's what I'm going to do and he was like are you, are you crazy? Like, you have, you've been promoted you have an amazing job people would kill for your job and I was like look I don't, you know, I don't have a family I don't have children why do I need to, like, I don't need to earn lots of money, I don't have any responsibility, you know, I'm young, I'm still youngish, I might as well just go and live my life and do the things that I want to do, I don't care about, you know, I've, I've had a good career, I'm, I've, I'm, I've enjoyed my, my work and my career, but now I want to just go and do something completely different. And um, he was really shocked, and the funny thing was, everybody was so stressed in that job, everybody was miserable. Um, I mean, we had a good time when we were working because we used to, you know, rally around each other, but it was a very stressful job. Um, when I left, apparently, after I left, it triggered loads of people to start thinking about what they were doing with their lives, and ten people left that company within six months, and it was like I started a trickle effect everybody started thinking about like well I'm earning loads of money but I'm so tired that what is the point of working like this
because I, you know if they don't have children and they don't have posh cars and expensive things to pay for you know why kill yourself it's it's just a, it's your life yes money is important if you need it but i mean how much money really do you need to have a good life in england really you know in a first world country you don't need that much anyway so and the places and a map of where I needed to go. So I went up to the, um, like the, the kind of the 
security, the helpers at the airport. And in, in very basic Spanish, I said, um, you know, por favor, donde es, you know, where is um, the bus station? And they looked at me completely blank. They didn't understand a word I said. And I was like, uh-oh. So I kept showing them the, the map and things. And they were like, um, they were like, no idea, no, no, I don't understand, I don't understand, no idea, no. And I was like, shit, shit. So um, I had a, a sh the bus that I had to catch, catch was, was, was like gonna leave very soon. So I had to get the bus quickly. And so I basically begged them in very, like I kept, I kept getting the book out and, and I basically begged them to please show me where, um, where I can get this bus. So eventually they, they, they went round to 10 different security people and they were trying to find somebody who could speak English and there was none, there was just one guy that could speak very, very basic English and I was like, please, please, you need to show me, you know, where this bus station is. And anyway, about 40 minutes later, I'm totally panicked by now, um, eventually we managed to work out roughly where it was I needed to go and so... I'm, I'm starting to walk out of the airport and I'm just praying that where they were they're just pointing, they like pointing at this place and I was just praying that where they were pointing was the right bus station because I don't know anyone in Mexico City, I'm totally screwed, you know. And as I'm walking through the airport, um, there was this man there who was probably in his 50s and he was like kind of wobbling and he came up to me I realised he was very, very drunk. He was pissed out of his mind. He could smell the whiskey on him. And he was like, in Spanish, in Spanish, he was basically saying, you know, I will help you, I will help you. I will show you where the bus station is. I will take your bag for you. I had a, you know, big suitcase. So I was like, I was that desperate for help that I just kind of said, well, yeah, okay. So this very, very drunk man... <laughs> took my suitcase and he was like wobbling along and he was like when he was started to he started to like run like through the streets you know and I was like oh shit so I started to kind of run after him and then I thought oh my god is he gonna steal my bag what's happening here and then we got to the bus station to this bus and he was like you know here here you know and I was like uh, you know a key a key so he, he did manage to buy me the I think it was the right bus, I don't even know, like I got on the bus and I, I didn't know if it was the right bus, if I was going to be sent somewhere completely different, I, I had no idea. And I, I get on the bus and he throws my suitcase on. Now this bus was completely packed, you, you could barely move, and everybody is speaking in very Spanish. Fast Spanish. It, it was like very confusing and, and very overwhelming. And then this, this drunk man was like, you know, De Niro, De Niro, money, money, because he'd helped me, you know. So, sorry, the, um, I'll go, I'll go put a light on in a minute. So, um, yeah, he threw my suitcase on, and then I, I spoke to the bus driver, and in very broken Spanish, I kind of basically just said, you know, the place I needed to go, and I gave the money, and I gave the wrong money, it was just a nightmare. Anyway, um, we, we set off and we're, we're driving for an hour in the pitch black, right, in the dark, and I have no idea if I'm going to the right place. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to pause for a minute while I put a light on. So, I was, um, I was on the bus and, um, it was pitch black, I had no idea where I was going. And, I, the, what I was panicking about the most was that I didn't know where to get off and I was like standing up in this huge crowd of people we were all like in like sardines and I was thinking I've got to get my huge suitcase off this bus and I've got to know where the hell I'm getting off I didn't know where to get off and it was dark and I'm trying to read the road signs and it was just a nightmare anyway at the end of the like about around an hour of traveling the bus stopped and I didn't know whether I was getting off here or the next stop or what. And luckily, like, a few minutes went by and everybody was getting off the bus. And not everybody, but, like, quite a few people. And then the bus driver, thank God, he pointed to me 
and he was like Inglaterra, Inglaterra, because that's Spanish for English. He was like, um, you know, basically you get off. And he was saying in Spanish, get off, get off. So thank God he told me. So I get off, and I'm still. It's dark. I don't know where I am, and I just I kind of walk around for half an hour, and eventually I found this like strange little bus stop thing, and I went down inside, down to the ground, and I spoke to the person on reception. Spanish um, and I had my map and my book and I managed to work out that I was at the right place thank god um, and then I had to wait like six hours for the bus because with it being you know um, the middle of nowhere they didn't have regular buses so for six hours I had to wait in this tiny little uh, room and uh, all they had was a, t a tiny little TV with, with, with Mexican TV and so that was quite stressful and then I get on the bus and it's a five hour journey and um, again I didn't know where to get off anyway I get off the bus right and I was thinking okay I think I found the right but I think I'm in Alapa I wasn't 100% sure but I got off and um, I kept asking people you know is this Alapa is this Alapa and somebody said you know yes or something supposed to go so that was at least good um, now it was funny because I walked I walked into the station where um, they have it's a huge station with loads of seats and I walked in and I don't know what I was expecting but um, like what I, what I saw was it was just I saw lots and lots and lots of faces of native Mexicans and when I say native I mean like they had very dark skin um, they had very like wide noses they basically looked very um, tribal you know like a proper Mexican not not like um, not like Spanish Mexicans and they look so different to me and I looked so different to them when I walked in, people were staring at me because they don't, they very, very, very rarely see white people. And so they were like staring at me and everybody was speaking to me in very fast Spanish. I didn't know what was going on. And I sit down and I had to wait, like, I was supposed to wait three hours. And then the, one of the people from the organization, the charity was supposed to come and meet me at the station and then drive me to the office, right? So I sit down and for three hours I try and get a phone and things like that so that I could like a, you know, a phone and a SIM card so that I could um, ring the charity, the organisation. But when I went into the shop, um, they didn't understand what I was saying. So they, I didn't know how to ask for a SIM card. <laughs> so eventually I, get a, I managed to get a SIM card. But when I put it inside my phone, when I ring to, to put credit on the phone, it's all in Spanish. I have no idea how to put money on my phone so and when I get there um, my English phone it you have to have like quite a bit of money in pounds to be able to ring someone in Mexico and because I'd been texting my, my family and my friends updating them with what was happening I'd spent 10 pounds of credit already it all gone so I had no way of contacting organization so I sat in this bus station right and three hours went by no one came four hours went by no one came five hours went by by this point I'd been there an extra two hours than I was supposed to be and I was really panicking now because I was starting to think hang on a minute I'm in this place in Mexico I don't know anyone I I've got no way of ringing anybody because I can't seem to up put the money on the phone I was just like sitting there thinking if no one comes to collect me I'm going to literally have to sleep rough tonight in Mexico <laughs> it was really scary um, anyway finally after six hours of waiting at this bus station um, this woman walked in and I she was looking around and, and saw this white face me you know, and she was like uh, Gemma Gemma and I was like yes now this was um, the receptionist called the Chell and she didn't speak a word of English <laughs> so she meets me and she's like you know we don't know what to say to each other <laughs> but 
she's like, come, you know, come with me, basically. So we get in the car, right, and we drive, and, you know, it's beautiful, but it's, it's bizarre, because where I was living in Mexico, where I moved to, um, because it was in the jungle, like, they have houses and they have shops, but the roads were just, like, dirt tracks. They don't have, they don't have proper, like, you know, tarmac roads or proper, like, they don't have proper, like, you know, traffic lights or anything like that. It's, it's very rural, you know, so it was quite a shock, culture shock, you know, um, and because it's, you know, it's, it's not a first world country, so they don't have the kind of money and the kind of government that we have, you know, it's very corrupt, it's crazy. Anyway, so, we get to the office, right, and this office was like up this really windy, mountainous hill thing, and the office, in inverted commas, was basically just like, it was, a, 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 it was somebody's house that had been turned into an office, and there was um, oxen and cows and chickens, it was basically like, like a rugged farm, farmland, with like just a building in the middle, so I get out the car, and I'm like, I'm having to walk through lots of, lots of bulls and cows and oxen and, and things, and there's like wild dogs in the street chasing me and barking at me, and there's like stray cats all over the place, like begging, like coming up to me looking for food, it was just, it was completely different to England, you know, like, I mean, I loved it, I loved it, because I love, I come from, um, Yorkshire, so I'm used to, far I love farms, but, it, and I love animals, but it was just like, it was so far removed from London, you know, and then, when I get inside the office, it's like, all made from bamboo, and wood, and everything, and, um, as soon as I walked in, there was cockroaches all over the desks, all over the food, you know, there was like, on where the coffee was and everything, <laughs> so that was a shock, you know, all the bugs were crazy, um, so, um, the plan was that I was going to live with people who worked at the organisation, I was going to live with, like, the boss and their family, and then I was going to get moved to a child and a child's family, and then another boss, so, basically, like, um, until I found my own little apartment to rent, I was going to live with the people who worked at the company, which was really nice, really nice of them to let me into their homes, you know, their family homes. So, the first man that I was going to live with, the first person I was going to live with, was, um, the CEO of the company, and, um, his name, his name, but his nickname was Mowgli, so, um, I went to go and live with Mowgli, so, um, I have a day in the office, and, you know, I'm saying hello to everybody, and welcome, they're welcoming, welcome, welcoming me, um, and then, this boss of mine, my new boss, he, we, we, we said, right, it got to five o'clock, he's right, we're gonna drive to his house now. I don't know what I was expecting, but what, what I ended up seeing and living in was mad. So, he had, he had a, um, an old truck for a car that was, like, used for cattle. So, he had no space in the front of the car because he had, like, other people in the car, dogs and things. And, like, in Mexico, they're very friendly, they're very um, accommodating people, they're not, like, British people, really. So, like when you're driving down the street in Mexico, if you see somebody walking, they will pick them up out of the kindness of their heart, and because where we lived was in the mountains, it's difficult for people to get around, there's not much public transport and things. I have to get in the truck, I have to get in the back of the truck, in the cattle grid, that's the way I have to, that's what I'm standing, like, in the back of the truck and holding onto the railings where the cows would normally go, and we set off, and it's about half an hour drive to his house and I'm holding on to the, the rails and I'm like, you know, it's really bumpy because the roads are like just dirt tracks and like, and the wind's in my hair and it was crazy, you know there's, there's no seatbelts there's no, like, public safety there's no health and safety so I'm just holding on to the rails on this cattle truck and I'm in the back of it and I'm just like rolling around <laughs> and we get we get to where near to his house and to be able to get to his house, he's got this steep hill, it's literally like that, right, and it's really windy, and, and it's 
so steep that the car can almost not grip the, the rocks on the on the path. And we start driving up and I'm like like this, like holding on. <laughs> and we, we finally get to the top and I'm thinking, my God, this is actually really, really scary. <laughs> and we, we get to, to we, we come round this bend and there's all these banana trees and coffee plants. It's literally in the middle of the jungle, in the far in the in the cloud forest, in the mountain. He literally lives in the top of one of the mountains. And we pull around the corner and I look and I swear to God, his house looked exactly like the Count of Monte Cristo mm-hmm. the Count of Monte Cristo's house. It was amazing. It was almost like a turret, you know, like a circular turret. And I found out later that he'd built that house himself. He designed it himself. And he lived in a like a coffee plantation and a banana farm. Um, and it was it was amazing, but it was bizarre. Um, and he, his wife was French. Um, and he had a lot of children. It was very nice. They had um, uh, they had a boxer dog, and the boxer just had lots of puppies. So there was like there was chickens and dogs and cats running everywhere in his house. And I, I walk inside, and it's it's beautiful. I mean, it's very very rural, but it's 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 beautiful. Um, yeah. And anyway, so they'd made a bed for me in the spare bedroom, and um, he said to me, "If you want a shower in the morning, we have an outside shower. Run off a generator, so I'll show you how to use it." And like we go around the back of his house, and it's just mud everywhere because he literally like lives in the top of a mountain you know so like we go around the back and we're traipsing through all this mud and then he's like and this is the shower and it was literally just like a tin can with a water supply and a generator (laughs) and he showed me how to use it and I was like okay so I go to with that night me and his me and the boss and the wife we get drunk on um he had homemade honey wine it was beautiful that they'd made themselves um and we get very drunk and um and then it was funny because they don't get that many international people there uh because it's so it's so in the middle of nowhere and the his wife who was you know this beautiful french woman she started to come on to me like he they got really drunk and she was being quite flirty with me and i was thinking like um okay I didn't quite know how to take that because I've just arrived and this is my boss's wife. So I was like, uh, I was flattered, but I was like, um, and then um, the my boss, sorry, my boss, um, oh, that's my stomach. Well, um, my boss, um, he starts to get quite angry at the fact that his wife is coming on to me. So, because I'm, I'm gay and they know I'm gay. So, um, and she was just, I think it was flirtation, but I think also she was just so um, happy to meet somebody from Europe because it had been a while, you know. Um, and she was fascinated by me for some reason. And um, anyway, so he went to bed in a huff. He was pissed off, you know. And he went to bed and then I was thinking, maybe I should go to bed too. So I tried to make an excuse to go, but she said to me, no, please stay because I've not seen anybody from Europe and I want to talk about, you know, um, England and Paris because I'd spent time in Paris. And, um, but she kept flirting with me really badly and I, I just kept thinking, this is not good because the last thing I'm going to do is, you know, flirt back with my boss's wife. <laughs> like, no. Anyway, so I was really embarrassed and I was thinking like, Gemma, and because I was drunk and because she was so beautiful, I was like, this is, this could turn, this could, I mean, imagine if I was so drunk that I'd ended up, you know, kissing her or something, and then he found out, I would have been thrown out and homeless, you know, <laughs> in the middle of Mexico. So, she finally gets tired, and she finally goes to sleep, and I go to sleep, and I walked into the bedroom, right, and itself was really nice, it was just a normal bed, and the room was really big, but when I looked up at the ceiling, there was all these insects, there was like 
spiders and like these, I don't even know what you want to call them, they were like kind of like beetles or cockroaches or something, but there was, there was all over the ceiling, right? And so like I climbed into bed and was looking up at them and I was like, shit, you know, because um, I don't mind books, but these were like crazy books, you know? And the funny thing is, is that when I was a kid, I idolised um, Indiana Jones. I used to get dressed up as him, I used to put the hat on, and I used to have a fake whip, and I used to always pretend I was Indiana Jones. And when I was a child, I always imagined that when I grew up, I would like, maybe I would, you know, do something that was like Indiana Jones. And so it was very funny when I got there, and all these books, and I basically was living the life of Indiana Jones, but I realised I'm no Indiana Jones. <laughs> anyway, so I go to sleep, but I, it was pitch black and I kept waking up because I kept hearing these really strange sounds. Everything from like coyotes howling, but that wasn't too bad. What was really bad was I kept hearing these noise, these insect noises inside the room, really loud insect noises. Now, they have a, 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 a beetle in that country and it's called um, the helicopter and it's literally about this big. It's it's the size of your hand. It's huge. And it has these big wings and it flies like a helicopter, but it makes a very, very loud noise. And, and it's very, it's not dangerous in any way, but it's just very loud. So I kept hearing these strange whirring noises and I kept thinking, okay, it's just that, it's just the helicopter bug, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. But it kept waking me up anyway at five in the morning I woke up because I felt this heavy thud on my knee, right? And I thought it was the, the wife or, or, or the, the boss, like, putting their hand on my knee to wake me up. So I kind of, I, I, I shoot up in bed and I turn the lamp on and I look and it's a fucking tarantula. It's a massive tarantula and it's on my knee. Now, I have a phobia of spiders, a bad one, so I, I don't like normal little house spiders in England, so to be woken up at five in the morning in Mexico with a tarantula on my knee was terrifying, and I just literally stared at it, like, <laughs> for about ten minutes, I just sat in bed frozen, unable to move, and I was just looking at it, and then it very slowly started to crawl towards me up my knee up my thigh and I was just like oh, 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 like I'm gonna die basically I'm gonna die <laughs> it was horrible um, and then I thought okay I know that if I scare it it'll probably make it worse but I need to somehow you know like make it want to climb off me so I started to move my knee a little bit to kind of like I was hoping it would scary away and it did finally it, it, it crawled off me and it crawled off the bed oh my god I'm telling you man to wake up to that it was terrifying right anyway then I lay in bed like this for about four hours I, 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 I couldn't go back to sleep I just lay in bed staring at the ceiling like and um, anyway um, everybody else was waking up in the house the kids and everything and they said to me um you know they made me breakfast it was a really nice breakfast and they were like um do you want um, to have a shower so i was like okay so first of all they said to me what's happened to your cheek here and i was like what and they said you've got a great big massive like bite here and i looked in the mirror and i had this huge circle big red welt here it was massive and um back to the boss and I said what you know what is that and he said oh that's a spider bite so I was like what he's like yeah it probably came off the ceiling and bit your face and I was like great <laughs> so I had this huge spider bite spider spider <laughs> bite on my on my um on my face anyway um so I go to have a shower right <laughs> and I'm standing there in the shower on and it's, the water is freezing, freezing cold, right? And uh, I'm just kind of like trying to, you know, get, get clean and I'm looking for some soap and at the side of the shower there's like um, a little um, 
there's um, a bar of soap and then there's this uh, plastic children's hair clip, right? And it was quite big. It was about that big, about this wide, right? And I thought that it was a, it was like bright blue and bright yellow and bright red and it had all these little knob knob nobules on it and I thought, oh, it's one of the kids, like hair, it must be like a hair band or something and um, I went to go and pick up the soap and as I reached my hand out to pick up the soap, the hair band, the hair band started to move and it, it, it kind of stood up and it had little legs and I realised that it ain't no hair band. It was only a blooming insect. It was like, I don't even know what it was. It was like um, a giant colourful like mini centipede is the only way I could describe it. But it was so scary. You know, when you feel putting your hand towards a bar of soap and then you see a children's hair, hair, pins, hair band start to walk away. You know, I was like, ah. <laughs> It was so scary and when I, when I was having when I was having a shower I looked up at the shower and there was all these insects like huge like I mean I don't know if you'd call it a cockroach but they were kind of like giant beetles or cockroaches and they were literally this big and they were all on the ceiling and they could like fall down and hit me it was terrifying I very quickly realised that I'm not Indiana Jones I am not cut out for that when I did eventually move into my own flat, um, I went to go to the toilet and um, th they used to have these these bugs, right? I'll I'll put some pictures on the video to show you. Um, but they were they were they were honest to god they were huge, right? And they had these long antennas, and the only way I could describe it was maybe like a giant cockroach, really. And when I used to go to the toilet. Um, they would, you'd walk into the toilet and all these bugs, these huge, huge insects would be there and then you'd walk in and they'd see you and they'd just scuttle away and they'd hide, right? Um, but then when you'd sit down to go to the toilet, um, because you're being quiet and still, they would very slowly start to creep up the walls again and up the toilet and in front of the sink and everything. So when you used to go to the toilet, you would be so scared that you would literally sit down and then you just like just pray that your wee would come quickly you know and then as you're like sitting there like going for a wee the in front of you what you'd see first of all is the antennas would come up first and then you'd see the little antennas doing that coming up from behind the sink and then you'd see their little face and then their legs and they'd all start crawling up the wall and you'd just be sitting on the toilet going please please just hurry up please and you didn't know if they were going to crawl up toilet basin and bite you, you know, because they, they had pincers and a lot of them were poisonous, oh my god, so going to the toilet in Mexico was just terrifying, anyway, so, um, I lived with that, with that cat, with that guy in the Monte Cristo house for quite a few days, um, and it was, it was amazing, but it was just such a culture shock, but, but amazing, and then, um, the Parisian guy, um, Fadi, he lived in a tree house in the jungle and my next place to go and live was with him so he picks me up in his car and we drive out and now we're going right into the mountains like literally inside the mountain and i said oh where do you live you know do you have a house and he's like no i live well yeah i do but i live in a tree house and i was like okay so we get there and literally he'd built I mean, it was amazing, the fact that he built it himself, but he spent a year building it and he literally had built a giant tree house in the trees, in the jungle, and you kind of have to climb, like, you get out of the car, and when you get out of the car, there's all these stray dogs, and they come running towards you, and they've got rabies and things, and they, like, kind of, some of them try and bite you, some of them are, like, friendly, but it's quite intimidating, you know, and I love dogs, but some of them scary. Anyway, we, we have to like climb up this like mud path and these trees and then we, 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 we go up this rope ladder and you climb inside his tree house and it's amazing. Um, I mean, the fact that this guy had built this house himself, he'd done the plumbing and everything, um, it, 
it was incredible, it was beautiful, and it was the first time in my life I ever saw fireflies, I'd never seen them before, and we used to like sit on the balcony in his treehouse, and there'd be all these fireflies, and it was very beautiful, but very bizarre that I'd come from London, you know, and I remember like looking out the window, and because he was so high up in a tree, you could see all of, um, like, Jalapa and Veracruz, you could see all of the mountain, and it, it was beautiful, but very, very basic, you know. Um, here's his love. When I, um, I managed to find my own apartment a few weeks later, and, um, I, I, I lived in a woman's house, and, well, what, it was like an apartment complex almost, and this woman was a, a, a mother, she was, she was like the head of a household, and she had um, quite a few children and things, and she rented these little rooms out to people like me, to like young people, students and that, and um, it was very basic, it was just like literally one room, and it was all white tiles, I had no furniture, um, the, we went out and we got a second hand furniture from people, like all different people in the charity helped me. And, um, they had no washing machine, so what you did was you walked down the, 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 uh, the, the kind of the, the, the hallway, um, and they had like a, um, a big, huge trough, like a, um, ceramic trough, and then it had like a, a, a ceramic, um, washing board on it from the 1950s. And when I wanted to wash my clothes, I literally had to fill the trough full of water, cold water. They didn't have hot water. And then I had to put washing powder in it. And then I used to have to hand wash all my clothes. And I used to do it on a Sunday. And then, I, and then what I would do is I would climb to the top of this apartment block thing. And then I would hang my washing on the top of the, the roof. And the roof was just this huge open plan roof. And they had no fences at all. So basically you walked up one flight of stairs and they had no, like in England we would have um, a wall or a fence so that you wouldn't fall off the edge, but in Mexico all their floors are like white tiles, so it's very easy to slip off them if it's wet and things, and then they had just a sheer drop off the edge of this apartment block and all the houses were designed like that, they didn't have any thought about people falling off the top of an apartment, it, it was crazy, they would have like five floors of just white tiles and white, like you know, white um, rocks, uh, uh, white um, stone, and then they wouldn't have any security, so you could just fall off the edge, it was crazy, um, so I used to climb to the top of this roof, and then I would hang my washing, but like, you could see all of Alapa, it was amazing, and it, it really reminded me of Beirut, you know, and it was just the fact that I could just walk off the edge and, and die, <laughs> it was mad. Um, one day, um, I still hadn't learned good Spanish, and um, one day, um, my room had a, uh, a, 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 a latch lock on it, and one day, I'd, it was about four in the morning, yeah, and I needed the toilet, and I'd gone out, the toilet was in like uh, the back of the apart back of the um, block, and it was the place where all the bugs came up, you know, it was an outside toilet, so I went out to use the toilet, and um, I was just wearing a pair of knickers, right, because it was so hot, and um, because it was pitch black and nobody was, and no one else was living there at the time, I didn't think about wearing any other clothes because I didn't expect to, you know, I wasn't going to bump into anybody, but the problem was, when I came back from the toilet, um, I'd forgotten to put the latch on my door, so my door had locked and locked me out, so I'm standing there on the top of this apartment block in just my knickers, and I'm holding my breasts, trying to hide from top, I'm holding my breasts, and I was like, oh my god, I'm locked out, I'm basically naked, what the hell am I going to do? So, I stood there for about half an hour, and I kept trying to get in, and I couldn't get in, and I thought, well, it's going to get light soon, so if I don't find a way of getting in, everyone's going to see me naked, basically, my niggas. So, I go downstairs, I go down the, to the bottom, to the ground floor, and I have to, I'm knocking on the woman's, on the family door, you know, where, the, where she lives with the family, and I had to wake them up, and I kept knocking and knocking, and eventually... Luckily, the son didn't come to the door, the woman did, and she opened the door, and she, she can't speak any English, and she's like, que, que, and I'm like, 
Ayuda, Ayuda, help me, help me. And I was, I was trying to explain to her in like, in, I was trying to like show her in sign language because she was looking at me like, what? Because she didn't understand why I'd be standing there half naked. And I was trying to explain that I'd gone to the toilet, you know, El Baño. Um, and I was like saying, you know, please help me, help me. And she didn't understand. And eventually I took her hand and I walked her up to my room and I showed her my, th my door was locked. And she said, oh, okay, okay. But at first she was just staring at me like, why have you woken me up at four in the morning naked? You know? <laughs> so thank God she let me in my room. But it was so embarrassing. Oh my God. I can't tell you how scared, how embarrassed I was. Um, you know, what was crazy, what was crazy about Mexico was that um, when I would go to have a shower, sometimes I'd go to turn the water on and there would be no water. So I'd be like, well, why is there no water? So this went on for about three days. And eventually I went to work and I'd made really good friends with one of the scientists and uh, she's a, a woman called Lily and she became my best friend. And uh, I was asking Lily, I said, why is there no water? And she said, oh yeah, yeah, it's Mexico. And I was like, what do you mean? She said, well, um, when the mountain doesn't rain, um, we don't have any water, like we don't have any water storage. So sometimes when the mountain doesn't rain for very long, um, we don't have any water, any running water. So I was like, so how do you clean yourselves? And she's like, well, you have to get a bucket and save that bucket of water and just wash yourself in the bucket. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, because in Mexico, you can't drink the water. It's full of insects. So um, every, all the water that you drink is bottled. So the only, so like drinking water wasn't an issue because you had to, as long as you bought it in advance. But to not be able to shower, I was like, but why don't they just have water tanks? And she's like, it's Mexico. They just, they don't think about plumbing and things like that. I don't care, you know. They don't have like a system. And I was just like, oh my God. So every few weeks when it would be really hot weather and there would be no, there'd be a drought, you just wouldn't be able to have a shower. So you literally had to save a bucket of water and then use that water to like, to clean it. <laughs> and like um, 
these giant like ants with pincers and like these little mini cockroaches and beetles and I'm sorry. These little these little mini like beetles and cockroaches and there was like giant cent there was like centipedes and oh my god. It was terrifying. I mean and the funny thing is I was desperate so I kind of squatted on it and as I'm squatting on the toilet I'm looking down and all these insects were like starting to crawl up my leg oh my god and they had huge pincers it was terrifying I mean I had to I had to use that toilet for weeks and like I remember like people kept saying why don't you on uh, uh, you know when I would when I talked to people when I got back people kept saying but why didn't you just find a bush or something because I told them there isn't a bush this is a farmland there's trees and there's um, lots of seeds and, and, and farming area but it didn't have they didn't have bushes you know there wasn't nowhere I could just run and hide and go to the toilet so I had to use this toilet and I just every time I just had to pray that I didn't get bitten by something oh my god on my butt oh my god it was so scary yeah so yeah I very very quickly realized that Indiana Jones. I am not. Nope. Um, yeah, but I had I had some great times there. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll post some pictures of that farm. The one of the first nights I was at the farm, they had a party to celebrate me being there, and they had amazing wine. That they it was like hooch wine, you know, wine they'd made themselves. They had a huge bottle of tequila, and the tequila is called in Spanish. It's called because it's this bottle and it's massive and it looks like a giant penis and that's what they called it and in Mexico they drink tequila like water so they literally pour tequila this you know like like, like, like a glass of water they pour in England the way that we drink tequila is we have it in shot glasses and then we have lemon and la uh, we have lemon and salt but in Mexico tequila is really good quality and to them it's like their it's their national drink so they don't drink in shots and they don't even understand the concept of why you would drink it in shots they just literally pour a huge glass a huge tumbler of tequila and they literally drink it like water it's crazy um yeah it was mad and then i remember once um in mexico they have these places called cantinas which is in england the equivalent would be a pub except that in um these cantinas are like very western you know they have like the old western doors and um one of my one of my local cantina from my from my office it was a five minute walk from my office um it was called um i think it was called something like the star so like la, la, la australia i think la australia la australia yeah and it was a beautiful cantina it, they had pictures of bullfighters and costumes and it was crazy and um, we used to drink there every week me and me and my me and my work friends who were scientists and we I was in the cantina once and um, my boss said to me um, have you ever had them um, you know tequila to them is nothing that's not their strong drink um, he said the drink that makes you a man, it makes you strong, it's called the kick of the donkey, um, I don't know how you say it in Spanish, it's something like, something, something, el burro, so, like, but it, it basically translates as the kick of the donkey, and he said, it's their, their proper strong drink, and I'd never heard of it, and he literally said, like, if you have two of these drinks, you will be knocked out, and I'm from North England, and we're notorious for drinking so I was like saying to him, oh, don't be ridiculous, like, I, you know, I bet I can drink you under the table, blah, blah, blah. So he kept winding me up and was like saying, okay, so drink the kick of the donkey and, you know, see how you go on. So I was like, okay, and I was so, I was so sure that I would be able to drink lots of this and I'd be fine. 
remove my head from the, I was like, glued to the table. And um, he said, so how's the kick of the donkey for you, Gemma? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know. And they had to carry me home. One day we were sitting there and these men came round and they had this strange machine with them. And my boss said, oh, um, do you have this in England, Gemma? We do this for fun. We electrocute ourselves. I was like, what? And yeah, what they do is this, these, these, these men or, or women, they, they come round and they have this machine and it literally gives you an electric shock and the game is you pay them, you pay them for the privilege and you, you know, you pay them like 12 pesos and then he cranks up the machine and you all hold hands and you do a circuit and it electrocutes you and it starts off very light electrocution and then the bolts get higher and higher and the aim of the game is that you all hold hands and whoever can stay holding the hands the longest whoever can take the pain the most is the winner and I was like looking at him going wait a minute you electrocute yourselves for fun you actually pay someone to electrocute you all and they were like yeah yeah it's a popular game and I was like you Mexicans, you, you're fucking crazy, you're all fucking loco, loco, loco. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I almost didn't believe it, you know. So anyway, we did it, I'll, I'll post the photographs, we held, we held hands, and then the, the bolts get higher and higher, and of course, I was the last, I was the very first one to break it, it was so painful, it was, it was crazy, I was like, why would you pay someone to electrocute you? <laughs> Mexicans are just completely insane. Yeah, anyway, so I have lots of stories about Mexico. Um, do you know the funny thing is, is that when I lived in Mexico, in England, I'm always late at everything. I'm notorious for being late and um, I'm very laid back about some things, you know. And when I lived in Mexico, they are late for everything. Like, timekeeping is just not a thing. Like, for example, restaurant or a cafe, um, you, you sit down and you expect to get like, you know, maybe soup and some tacos or something, and you sit there and an hour, a whole hour will go by and you get no food, sometimes not even a drink, and there'll just be like this little old lady who is working, who is the, um, the chef, you know, the cook, and she will just be like slowly pottering around, doing her own thing. And I'm like, why are we waiting for an hour? You, you know, what's going on? There's nobody else here. She's not busy. And I said to, to my, my, my colleagues and my friends, you know, like, 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 what? We, you know, we're in a cafe. We're in a restaurant. Like, why does it take an hour to get, to, for her to even ask what we want to eat? And they said, it's Mexico. They were like, there's no, nobody's rushing. There's no, there's no, like, time frames, you know. So I was just like, okay. But it was funny because, like, Mexico was the first country, like, the, the only other country that I lived in where people said, you fit in here so well, like, you're more Mexican than you are British, you know? And it was funny, like, in England, everybody used to always be telling me off and having a go at me for being too wild, for drinking too much, for being too... Um, enjoying parties too much and being too wild and too crazy and then finally I moved to a country where I was considered too tame you know they used to say to me you're not wild enough and you're not crazy enough and I was like god you're joking in England I'm considered too crazy and too wild and here in Mexico I was always I could be late and nobody cared I could go to party after party drink as much tequila as I wanted and that's their culture, you know, and they're so friendly, you know, like the people over there, some people, they can't even afford rice to eat, you know, and yet they had nothing, they had no money for anything, and yet they were so happy, and they were so friendly, and they would share everything with everybody, um, yeah, it was funny, like, even though they're very, very poor people, what they would do is they would go and buy these big bottles of cheap beer 
inside each they get like tumblers of beer and in each tumbler in every time they have beer they would put in um, chili powder um, and uh, grinds of like lemon and all these spices and then they would stir it and that's how they would drink their beer so all their beer would have spices in it and chili powder and lemon and lime and it sounds weird but it, it was actually really nice but it was strange you know and it's funny that they never really went to apart from the cantina occasionally most of the time they would drink um people would like pull up chairs outside the houses and they would just drink all night cheap beer sat on the mountain you know they'd just be sat outside on the mountain it, it was really nice really nice it was a beautiful country i mean they had nothing, they had no, like, they had no infrastructure, they had no money, but they led simple lives, but they were so happy, and they danced, they were always dancing the salsa, and, um, yeah, they were just beautiful, joyous people to be around. I, um, I ended up moving back to England because I got sick, but I made friends there that I'm still so close with um, I speak to them like every week and they, they've come to visit me from Mexico, you know, they've come to visit me in England I you know, I've never really worked with scientists before but I, I had a really strong, close connection with them on a personal level we had so much in common because, you know, we yes, they liked to party yes, they went to big fiestas every day, they would have um, parties and things, but they were very passionate about science and wildlife and about the planet, and they were very intelligent and very, like, um, they had very clever concepts of how to solve problems and things. I, I just, I love them. I just love them. I mean, they have a lot of problems out there, obviously, um, with um, corruption and with um, violence. But this video will be too long. I want to tell you next time. I'll tell you about the poli what happened when um, the police would stop me because that was scary. Because the police are not like the police in England. And um, I'll tell you about different um, crazy parties that I went to. I went to some crazy parties. Um, and also, I had a run in with this this guy who ended up. Um, attacked my kitten, I had, I had a, a kitten that I adopted, and he stole from me, he, he basically, he burgled me, and then he, yeah, anyway, but I have a lot more stories about Mexico, there were crazy stories, but this video's gone on way too long, so, anyway, yeah, so, that's my little uh, story about what happened when I arrived in Mexico, um, I hope that I remember to post the pictures, because, um, they're quite, they're quite good to tell the story. Anyway, I hope you uh, enjoyed that. I'm sorry that I speak so fast. Um, I, I tend to find that I get very excited and then I get very animated and um, I can't speak slowly, so <laughs> sorry about that. But anyway, um, I hope you have a nice evening and I hope you have a nice sleep. No te he dejado de amar